Hey gearheads and welcome to Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I'm Corey. And I'm Matt. And each week this pod, I forgot what I was supposed to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, this is, um, it's par for the course because we had Brian back a year ago on right, our show right. and that one interview turned into two episodes. So I should have just prepared for it. I know he likes to talk. I know he's got tons of stories to, to tell. Oh, yeah. And uh, where is it for us to step on his toes and cut him off halfway through well, an sure. epic story of uh, running the Mint 400? So uh, last week, we talked a little bit catching up with him. Uh, we actually met Bryant in person at the Texas Truck Rodeo put on by Texas Auto Riders Association. And uh, this week, we're going to dive into his Mint 400 race experience. It's been about three years since he's been behind the wheel of a race truck, and he has got quite the story to tell this week. So we'll just jump right into it. And uh, but no, it's it's that's that's one of the things that that I really appreciate about that truck is that I am a blue collar person. I, I'm doing this out of my own pocket. I work. I try to work really hard to to provide these opportunities for myself and for others. Uh, if I can afford to bring people with me that haven't done this before or haven't had the chance to do this before or don't know anything about the sport i really really enjoy doing that every trip i make in some way i i try to involve someone that hasn't been involved in it whether they don't know anything about it or they've just always wanted to go yeah now i'll i, I will note that with that person and I have to get along. Right. We're going to be with each other for a long time in a very strenuous situation. But I, it's, it's almost an open invite to anybody that if you are willing to put in a little bit of effort to show me that, that you can put up with the situation and be dedicated to it, I will take you along on these adventures because it, it, it brings so much joy to me. And it's such a lifelong dream of mine to do this that that I know that other people will benefit from it in their lives by yep. being a part of it. And and that's what that truck represents. It represents just the everyday person and having it uh, for some reason showing up at the Mint. They changed when I was racing about two weeks before I left. I was supposed to race on Friday with all of the limited classes which would be more reasonable than what I actually did. <laughs> um, but I'm glad I didn't for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons was that there were like 150 competitors on Friday. Oh, man. And the course would have been just a traffic jam yeah. with all kinds of machines, most all of them faster than me, and it would have been stressful dealing with all that traffic. Um, the, the other the other thing about that is that I was moved to Saturday and I had really the only very limited vehicle in a field of trophy trucks, spec trophy trucks, class one cars, yep. Yep. Um, Bailey Campbell's ultra four car and 10 class 10 cars. I stood out like a sore thumb <laughs> in that crowd. <laughs> Which was awesome. Yeah. Because that got me more attention. And I'm not yep. going to lie. I may be a bit of a peacock. <laughs> like but but it allows me to interact with people and to show them that, hey, you can do this too. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not anybody special. I'm just someone that wanted to do this. So I figured out how to do it. And anyone can do that. Uh, you know, and, and uh, being able to have my truck out there in a field of million dollar 1200 horsepower trophy trucks you know i was i was parked amongst jesse james and the concrete motorsports guys and my buddies from texas here uh, adam lund he was out there in his class one car and sterling miller he's another texas guy was in his trophy truck and robbie gordon i think qualified but i don't know that he made it into the race but all of these big huge names rob mack luke mcmillan i mean ryan arciero these are people that build the sport you know some of these guys built the sport from the very beginning you know and and the rest of these guys do this on a level that i can only dream of and here i am in my old work truck parked out there 
trying to trying to get a little bit of the of the action and uh, it was it was a wild experience being thrown in with that crowd so i appreciate that unfortunately i think that that was part of the downfall of my race uh in my actual race so tech and contingency goes well everyone loves the truck it looks amazing i'm sure there's lots of pictures and people talking about it whatnot yep, uh, it's yep. just it's just a huge machine that that sits taller than everything else, just as wide as everything else. And it has this tribute livery to my hero, Rod Hall, on it that almost everybody that knows anything about off-road racing would recognize. Uh, it was cool. Uh, take it to the race. We stage. We get in. the. They do a grid walk, so all of the spectators get to come out on the grid and walk amongst all the race vehicles and talk to all of the drivers and everything like that. And that was such an awesome experience. I got to shake a lot of hands and hear a lot of people say, hey, I got one of these or my dad's got one of these. And I'm like, that's exactly what I'm talking right. about. Yeah. You know, and they look at a trophy truck and they're like, man, I wish I could have one of those one day. Well, you can have mine. No, you yeah. can't have mine, but you can yeah. have one like mine. Yeah. You know, and uh, and it's it's doable. It's doable. So that was awesome. We get lined up. I start. 59th i think so there are 58 trophy trucks and spec trophy trucks ahead of me and there are 10 class 10 cars behind me and i told my co-driver who is the host of another podcast the yep. truck show podcast yep. uh jay tillis he had never been in an off-road vehicle before this was a brand new experience for him uh and i was really fortunate that he said yes and wanted to be a part of it i tell him i said hey man Watch that mirror because those 10 cars are going to catch us. And I don't know how the truck's going to run. I've only driven it three miles in three years. Yes. <laughs> it's got 70 gallons of fuel in it, but at least a gallon, if not two gallons, that is sea foam still. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, yeah. we're still not sure what's going to happen. So we nail it off the line. The flames go up like you're at Supercross. And I hit the first little jump. It was pretty good. I hit the second jump, and it catches quite a bit of air. And my co-driver, this is his first time <laughs> in an off-road truck, in an off-road race. He, uh, he, he, I'm not sure if he was prepared for that or not, <laughs> but, we, you know, he handled it like a champ. He did a very good job. We drive through the infield. It's so cool. The truck sounds amazing. It sounds beastly. It's going really slow, uh, but that's, you know, right on pace for me. Right. Uh, somebody said it was smoking off the start line, which is probably that sea foam running through it. That's, that's okay. Uh, and by the time we get out onto the course and out of the infield and the speed zone sections, by about race mile 15 or so out of a 97 mile loop, uh, every single one of those class 10 cars had already passed me. <laughs> 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 in like the first 15 miles oh of man days, which that's okay they're not in my class right not not a big deal so all that means is that until the trophy trucks come back around which i know they're going to do <laughs> there's nobody in, there's nobody coming yeah there's nobody ahead i got clean air i can just race my race yeah and so i just get after it and just start driving and feeling the truck out and making sure all the bolts are tight and the <laughs> steering wheel still attached and all that stuff. And we passed a couple broke down cars along the way. And I thought, well, there's a couple, we passed that one. We passed that one. Look at that. We're doing all the good. Small and, victories. Uh, yep. We, uh, we make it to about the, and the course is rough because 150 cars had already been through there and, 70 some odd competitors at my race had already been through there before me yeah 40s and 42 inch tall tires and thousands of horsepower the course was rough it was it was rough and my truck solid front axle on 37s there's not a lot of ground clearance and so the ruts were a problem they didn't feel too bad on the first lap i thought okay i think we can manage the truck is not running great it's running okay uh, it is not downshifting when I need it to downshift, and I have no control over that transmission. It's that 545 RFE stock stock transmission. It is not the original trans. It is the original motor, 
that came in the truck off the off of the assembly line. But I think it's the third transmission. The previous owners of the truck took them a little while to figure out cooling issues with racing. So they burned a couple up. But that was the transmission I bought the truck with six years ago. Wow. All we had done was change the fluid. And I didn't even change the fluid for this race. <laughs> it was still pink. So it's still good. There you go. And it was still in there. So that's good. That's good enough for me. Uh, I like to say that I prep my truck in the O'Reilly's parking lot. That <laughs> and I can return my spare parts to get my money back. Oh, God. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I got to thank my buddy Tipton for that little trick. That's a good trick right there. Um, so, yeah, so the transmission is not – it's not made to do what we're trying to do with it. It is made to be in that truck stock, yeah. but on 37s and trying to race and be constantly in terrible terrain, it doesn't like it very, very well. And it's probably not geared properly either. We've got four 11s in it and I'm changing all that before my next race uh, in 2022. But anyway, we get to about race mile 41 and the truck just bogs down. <clears throat> excuse me and it i'm not going anywhere and i thought oh man that's not good oh no actually three miles into the race it starts to overheat and i thought oh we're done <laughs> turns out uh i lost one of the connections on my switch for my electric fans which were brand new on a radiator that was brand new oh, and gosh. all untested and uh we had melted those both the fuses for the fans during tech and contingency two days before. Ugh. So we rewired all of that at the Airbnb and, uh, and doubled up some wiring and changed that up a bit. And then my first set of fans went out and the truck started getting hot. And I thought, uh, I actually said to my co-driver, well, we're done. The engine's gone. And, uh, and then I looked down and noticed that my indicator lights were not on. I flipped my other backup set of fans on. And it stayed on and was running, and the temperature started coming down. I said, "Up, oh, never mind. We'll just keep going. Don't worry about it. Uh, False alarm. So that happened right away. Then we get passed by 10 Class 10 cars, which we can't see because the dust is so thick. And fortunately, none of them nerf me, which is where they run up behind you and hit you to let you know that they're there. None of them did that, which was probably wise on their part because they would have been hit, hitting my differential <laughs> instead of my bumper because uh, the truck's so big. Uh, let them all go by. We get to race mile 41 and, uh, and the truck bogs down and stops. And I'm like, Oh, yikes. Not good. Uh, fortunately I was only in two wheel drive. So we pop it down into four high and she takes off and we keep going. I thought, okay, good. We're okay. Now we're going to leave it in four wheel drive. It's always a question whether to run from the beginning of the race in four wheel drive or two wheel drive. You have risk either way. My truck is 9,000 pounds with a solid front axle. If it's in two-wheel drive, it's bulldozing the front axle, and it's very, very heavy to go through corners and to go through silt beds and all of that. However, if you are in four-wheel drive all the time and you take a jump and land on the throttle, it'll snap the front U-joints. Mm. That has happened to us at our very, very first desert race ever. Oh. So you have to be cautious on how you drive the vehicle in whatever range you're driving it in two wheel drive or four wheel drive or four low or whatever. Uh, so I, I prefer to err on the side of caution, use four wheel drive if you need it or else it's going to potentially cause a bigger problem for you sure. in the future. Sure. Well, we needed it after we put it in four wheel drive and kept going. Uh, the truck ran way better. It was like the extra drag from the transfer case in the front axle was keeping the transmission in gear better. So it wasn't hunting for gears. It wasn't upshifting too high. It was doing great. So I said, okay, four-wheel drive the whole time it is. That's what we're going to do. We make it through the remote pits and people are cheering us on. And I always wave, wave at all the people and tell my co-driver, hey, wave at the people. I'm looking at the map. No, this the people are more important than where yeah. we're going. Yeah. Wait at the people. They want to see us and uh, honk the horn tell them we're here. And uh, so we wave at the people and that's awesome. We go through the quarry section, which was rough. The course is pretty rough. We go through another remote pit and then we come to mind you, this is all the first lap. I'm only at race mile 70 now out of 97. Uh, we come to this like sharp, 100 degree corner that immediately goes uphill 
And when I'm rolling up to it, it is blown out. Mm. That corner is toast. It is super deep, super soft, and I do not carry enough speed going into it. And we high center the truck. And just all four tires are throwing dirt. And I'm like, well, not good. Yeah. Fortunately, the the people putting on the event knew that was going to be a bad spot. So they had recovery people stationed there. Yeah. And my co-driver starts to unbuckle, and before he can get unbuckled, there's a silver F-150 backed up to my front bumper, and they're they're out, and they got the strap strapped onto the front of my truck, and he can obviously tell that my truck is big, and so he just nails it, and it snaps his toe strap. Pow! (laughs) Flies right in the back of his tailgate, and I don't move an inch. (laughs) And... uh, and so they back up and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do to try to get me out of this corner. Um, I tell my co-driver, Hey, get out and help, help them. Cause that's part of your duties. If you're driving, if you're riding in the, in that seat, in the, in the right hand seat there, uh, I've got traction boards in the truck that I can put under the tires so that we can crawl out under our own power. So uh, I tell the, one of the recovery people, Hey, I've got boards, grab them, whatever. Fortunately, they had another truck there, and I didn't see any of this happen, but they just said, hey, he's going to pull you out backwards. I said, okay, what? I don't care. Just get me get out me of out. here. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> uh, and they hook up to whatever that was. I didn't know at the time what it was, and they just yank it backwards, and he doesn't stop. He keeps going and going and going and going, and I'm like, we're, we're out of it. Let's yeah. Get me off of this thing. And uh, they unhook, and I take that corner real wide, my transmission doesn't downshift, and we just barely crawl up this loose, rocky, silty, sandy hill, get to the top, and we keep going. Okay, let's keep going. We come along to about race mile 88, 90-ish, and we're on a dry lake bed, and we're doing like 74 miles an hour, which is <laughs> cooking. We are cooking. And there's not a lot of dust in front of us. We're doing awesome. And then both my co-driver and I, we hear this rumble and we're like, well, that's not my engine. That's something else. And here comes Luke McMillan in first place in a, in a trophy truck. And he's running probably 140, 150 miles an hour. Wow. Right past. I mean, right past us. (laughs) This giant (laughs) dust cloud is following him across this dry lake bed, which is about three, three or four, five miles long. And it just starts to swamp us. And as it's coming across us on the other side, we hear Rob Mack in his trophy truck, thousand horsepower, whatever. Boom! Pass us. So there's the leaders. We are on lap one. They are going to finish lap two before we get to the end of lap one. So I'm like, we got to get trouble. So now we've got two dust clouds coming in on top of us. And when, when I say dust clouds, I literally mean yeah. I cannot see the steering wheel in front of my face. Yeah. This stuff <laughs> absorbs, absorbs you. And unfortunately, that weekend, there was little to no wind. <clears throat> and across this dry lake bed, there are giant power lines that move electricity from the Hoover Dam to Los Angeles. I mean, I'm talking about these things are a hundred plus feet tall and Mm. they've got a base of like four legs that are 30 feet apart. These are huge and they are right in the middle of where we're trying to go. (laughs) I cannot see them. (laughs) And my co-driver who is new, brand new to off-road racing is trying to read the GPS and zoom in as far as he can so that we can drive by that instead of by sight. And he's like, I don't know. Just keep going straight. That's what the line says. Oh man. We just keep rolling, and I slow way down. And I'm like, well, if I slow down too far, someone's going to run into the back of me at 80 miles an hour. Yeah. Because these professional trophy truck drivers that do this type of racing all the time, they can drive by GPS. Yeah. So they don't have to see. And some of these guys are fearless in the dust. Mm. And they will run 100 miles an hour with no visibility because they're, they're trusting their GPS and their navigator to give them the calls on how to do it. I cannot drive like that, uh, especially after not having driven my truck for over three years. Yeah. You know, it, I'm not in that position. So we finally get through that 
and we start coming in to to uh, back towards civilization, and we get into the pits. We take our we take a break. Um, get out. I have my team, my pit crew. So I, I ended up uh, a couple guys that I knew. One of my former partners in the truck. He came down as my crew chief because he knows the truck and he's an extremely talented fabricator. Jared Blocker out of Kerrville. He flew out to Vegas to be a part of this. I, I really appreciate that. Um, the rest of the pit crew was made up of guys that I'd never met before. Uh, I'd only known them through uh, Facebook and online. It's the Dodge Trucks Extreme Group. Mm -hmm. And my pits were all Mopar, baby. We had all <laughs> three-quarter and one-ton Dodge Rams. That was the only thing out there representing my team. And it was amazing. And uh, they, they were having their own parties and stories in the pits. Uh, that I didn't even know about because I was in the race car. And uh, so we pull in, and they they had never done this type of stuff before, really. Some of them maybe a little bit, but most of them were new to this to everything. But they got after it. We popped the hood. They start looking at stuff. I tell them what I felt was wrong with the truck that needed to be looked at immediately. My co-driver, Jay, he jumps out. My buddy, Brian, from, from Amarillo, he's another Dodge guy. I've known him for a long time, and it's been his dream to race in this race officially. He's raced it unofficially, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he jumps in and starts getting strapped in. I drink a little bit of water. I eat some beef jerky. I feel a little better about myself. Um, got out and, you know, settled my nerves and knew what the course looked like and where the problem areas were going to be and what I needed to expect for the next lap and the next three laps uh, after after our first one. Uh, they fuel the truck. It takes like 22, 25 gallons of fuel out of that 70 gallon tank. I had no idea what the fuel consumption was going to be. I estimated between three and six because that's what it had gotten in the past. It was getting about 3.8. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, that means I can go two laps on one tank of fuel and it's fine. We won't have a problem. Cool. So all that math is going through my head. I'm asking them, you know, I, I don't want to know what my lap times are while I'm running, but as I'm completing a lap, I have a very limited amount of time to finish this race. Uh, and I don't go as fast as the rest of the vehicle. So time is my enemy. Yeah. And they tell me that I made this lap estimated right around three hours to do 97 miles. So I was averaging about 32 and a half, 33 miles an hour. I thought, okay, yikes, that's, we got some work to do in order in order to uh, to to take care of that. So I'm gonna have to pick up the pace, get back in the truck, get strapped in, go through the the starting gate for the first lap, and that's when uh, the big huck that everybody saw on TV. That's when that <laughs> happened, and uh, all the announcers were talking about me coming through. And uh, Bob Bauer, he's an extremely talented and famous uh, off road racer and support person and he's been to Baja millions of times and whatnot he uh I met him during I, I'd known him online and whatnot and then I finally got to have a conversation with him at Tekken Contingency and that's why he made the statement that uh when he first met me he said this guy's nuts <laughs> and he said after after you talk to him for a little while you realize that he he's not nuts but oh, that sure seems like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I hucked the truck my co-driver is still getting used to his belts because this is his first time to race in something like this at this capacity. So he's trying to get his belts to sort it, and I'm trucks flying through the air. <laughs> Looks just like a trophy truck, weighs 9,000 pounds. <laughs> Here we go. And uh, I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> so we make it through. We're still in four-wheel drive. We make it through. Uh, we get out onto the course a little ways. The truck is feeling good. I can tell that we are moving way faster than we were on the first lap yeah <clears throat> we make it to like race mile 20 in probably half the time that it took me the first time oh wow to to go through so we were we were moving we we were making up some ground i was happy but i was real happy about it by about that time i started getting into parts of the race course that were being torn up more you know softer stuff that gets torn up a lot easier and I was noticing a difference in the course just in one lap for me. It was like one and a half or two and a half laps for everybody else <laughs> by that time. But one lap for me, it was 
there were going to be problems. And I told my co-driver, I said, man, this is, this is rough. About race mile 20, 23, 24, the truck is not driving right. The back end is kicking out over some stuff where it shouldn't be doing that. It's not, it doesn't feel right. And it's just constantly throwing up dirt and rocks and all that stuff throws up. I don't have a cow on the truck between the dashboard and the, and the hood. So it all blows through the engine compartment and into the cab. And I can hear the rocks and everything banging up against the bottom of the truck and the, the skid plate under the transfer case and all that. And I thought, man, this course is trash and we have to do three more laps of this. <laughs> this is going to be tough. And by about race mile 25, I, I tell my co-driver, I said, man, something, something's not right. Something is not right with this truck. Uh, by about race mile 26, 27, I'm like, hey, we need to find a spot to pull over. We need to look at this thing. I feel like all four tires are flat mm -hmm. on the truck because it is just dragging so much. Every time it would hit hard pack in the ruts, it would slow the truck down two to five miles an hour. Mm. And we're doing 30, 40. So that's a hard, yeah. Hit, right? yeah, you know, and all of the weight of the truck is impacting right on the front of the truck. And it just drags us down and slows us down and drags us and slows. I'm like, man, something's not right. The tires have got to be flat or something. So we pull over, find a good clearing. We pull over. My co-driver jumps out, looks at the front passenger tire. And he says, nope, this tire's good. Goes around to the front, and he notices something under the front. And then he tells me, hey, turn turn the steering, steering wheel back and forth. Rock the steering. And as I rock the steering, steering he's like, nope, kill it. Uh, the front diff is cracked open. No. And it was just a sheet of oil mm. falling down. And I'm like, okay. So I kill it, and I get out, and I look at it. And uh, the... Where the truss meets the differential on the bottom part of the driver's side of the front axle had cracked and was separating away from everything. Uh, and it was just pouring differential fluid out. And as we sat there, we noticed that it was also leaking transmission fluid. So I crawled underneath and looked, and there was one corner of the trans pan had a big old dent in it. Uh. And, and it was all wet, and fluid was just dripping pretty solidly out of that as well. And I said, well, we're done. I don't, we're not going to be able to get out of this. Yeah. And uh, he said that when he went back down the course to put out our safety cones to show people that we were broke down out there, he could see in the center of the ruts, the front differential and the rear differential were making marks. Good dragging grief. Just so it was just a solid line. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in parts of that race course, there was no way for me to get out of those and yeah. try to drive on top of them right. with having to clear brush or having to go through, you know, boulder fields on the sides of the course. It just wasn't going to happen. I couldn't avoid it. Um, so that ended our race. We made it 20, I think 28.7 miles into lap two. Uh, the sun was still up, so it was probably about, 2.30 in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We radio out to the pit crew. Uh, I had a little bit of cell service. I made some phone calls, said, hey, we're done. I knew that we were going to have to wait there till the course was clear in order for the crew to come, be able to come get, get us. Uh, so my buddy Brian and I, we just uh, found Spotify on the iPad and cranked up the, the Texas country <laughs> tunes and played some 1100 Springs and uh, – Started eating some beef jerky and drinking some water and hanging out and telling yep. stories and watching race cars go by. And I've decided now that the, the truck is going to get a cooler that will hold a six-pack of beer and some lawn chairs <laughs> Heck for yeah. the next race. Just in case this happens again, we'll sit out there and party in style oh, uh, if man. we have to break down again. But, yeah, we, uh, we lost the front diff. Um, the course was strenuous enough for that first 30 miles that I knew – if we tried to go further, we were going to create bigger problems on the truck. Right. And I just can't afford big, oh, huge yeah. problems on the truck. So at some point, you have to mitigate risk and damage right. versus sure. trying to finish. I did not want to give up 
you know, I, I was not giving up, but the equipment would not do it. And right. I knew it wouldn't do it the way that it was. And there's no way we could have made through the rest of the course with only two wheel drive. If we had disconnected the front axle or whatever, uh, it just knowing the problems we had in four wheel drive on the first lap, yeah, it wasn't going to do it. The truck wasn't going to make it. it. That course beat us. Um, and it beat us pretty hard. Now I will say that part, part of the reason I feel like this failure came about was dragging the differential. Part of it is that this, as far as I know, is the original axle in the truck. So this axle has raced like 7,000 off-road yeah. race miles <laughs> without ever being retrussed or re-welded or any of that. I've replaced a couple pieces on it, diff- the differential guard and the stub axles we replaced when we first got the truck after our first race. Uh, but all, the U-joints, everything, all of that was all from our second race on, you know. So mm. even those pieces wow. that we put on the truck had thousands of race miles right. on them uh the hubs had probably almost 2,000 race miles on them and all that you know and uh i equate off-road racing for the moving components less the engine and transmission to be about a 50 to 1 yeah versus road miles so for every thousand miles it's 50,000 or more miles of wear yeah. and tear yeah. on the vehicle um the the motor and transmission ah it's probably closer to one to ten yeah. or so because it doesn't work that hard it gets jostled around but I'm doing seventy miles an hour you do that on the highway you guys do right, that with right. that truck pulling you know thirty thousand pounds right. of cows behind it it's it can do that but the moving components the components in in contact with the dirt the suspension pieces moving up and down it's it's 50 to one uh road miles versus race miles or more you yeah know, 70 to one or so so it, it lifespan on things is shortened dramatically um so did yeah, you come so away that, with the w well unofficially unofficially so i was not expecting we didn't finish the race right so i'm not expecting anything to happen you know uh, we go, we get the truck loaded up. My guys come out and they're all excited because they get to drive their badass dodges on the race <laughs> right. course and come get me. And, and then they strap up and drag me out. And it's cool. Everyone has fun because all of our trucks are built for the desert. You know, yeah, right. all yeah. of their trucks are, my trucks are. This is what we, what we like to do with these ridiculous vehicles that are not the right machine to do that with. <laughs> right. We do it anyway. Uh, so they had a blast coming out to come rescue me. I know they had a good time with all that. Um, we didn't feel defeated i was disappointed and and a little embarrassed as as you've seen in in that video that i posted of the helicopter footage if you watch that uh i kind of explain some of my emotions through the deal i was ready to fix the truck and try again uh and i and i really appreciated the opportunity to bring people into the sport and to meet people uh everyday people and show them that this was possible and to to provide opportunities for people to ride in the truck and to be my pit crew and to meet and make new friends and, yeah. and to, to honor Rod Hall and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I really appreciated those opportunities. Um, but I was bummed because I, I really like that my truck is able to finish. Before this race, we have raced that truck 10 or 11 times and we've only not finished once. And that was our very, very first race when we were learning about yeah. how to do what we were doing. Um, so this is a second DNF, you know, we didn't complete the race and that's embarrassing for me because I, I make it a point that my truck survives and gets to the end. And I was not entirely prepared for the way the course degraded in such a short amount of time. Sure. Uh, I, I wasn't quite ready for that. I, I knew it would be bad, but I didn't realize it would be that bad. <laughs> um, so we get back and we, we have a good night. We, we go out to dinner and whatnot. And the next day as we're leaving town is the award ceremony. So I like to go to that, you know, shake the babies and kiss the hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, do all those things and network and meet people and talk and just be present because I, 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 I try to represent my state and the sport in my state and 
me racing and everyday people racing. And so it's good to just show up to those things. And yeah. Plus there's some really cool people that are there that, that, that are legendary people, which is unique to off-road racing in that me, a, a nobody can meet these people and have a conversation with them. Like we're the, on the same level, just like me racing on the same race course as, you know, Luke McMillan and Rob Mack and Jesse James and all of these big name famous off-road racing <laughs> or famous people in general. Yeah. And then you have Bryant Blakemore in his stupid work truck. What is he <laughs> doing here? Oh, he's off-road racing. You can't do that anywhere else. Yeah. Formula One, not a chance. Yeah. NASCAR, not happening. Super high-level drag racing, maybe, but it's going to cost you a whole lot of money. Oh, yeah. You know, but off-road racing, you can do it. You can yeah. do it. And that's that's amazing for me uh, for as, as being a part of the sport. So I, I have to go to all the things that happen. So we go to the award ceremony and, and, uh, we're listening to the classes going through and there was a lot of really cool stuff happening. Um, some of the motorcycle classes were Harleys with dirt bike front ends <laughs> that, that raced like sportsters and whatnot. Wow. I mean, yeah. Those guys are wild. And then some of my buddies that are part of the gambler crew, they raced a, Coleman, five horsepower pull start mini I, bike. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. They they did that and they won. They were oh, like gosh. a 250 cc or less class or something like that, and they were the only ones entered. And they raced it on that 600 dollars Coleman mini bike. You oh. tractor supply. Those guys are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about someone who's actually nuts? <laughs> there yeah, you go. those guys. But yeah, so it was cool, and then they start getting into the trucks and the vehicle awards, and again, I am not expecting anything. You yeah, know, I I am friends with the guys that put on this this race, but I I'm not looking for any kind of recognition. I did not finish the race, and I I knew that I was just there to support them and the whole event and everything in general. Right. But they call class eight. And I'm like, well, I'm the only class eight. And then they say my name and I'm like, what? <laughs> no way. No way. And sure enough, I, I, I'm calling it an honorary first place. And for whatever reason, the, the race association, the, the guys with the mint decided to award me the trophy for, for being there and, and finishing one lap. And participating and making it. That's awesome. Nobody else showed up. Right. No, none of the other class eights showed up, you know, and, and so I, I, I struggled with feeling like I deserved that because I didn't finish the race and I, I let myself down and, and I feel like I let other people down, but the more that came out about our experience there and the more I learned about the people that saw the the truck and and were inspired by it to try to do something yeah and the more i learned that people notice what i'm doing and and follow along and it helps push them towards their achievements i thought okay well we'll take this as an honorary award for putting in the effort yeah and being there it's not an official placing i don't count it as an official placing. <laughs> bryant uh, I, let me remind you you had driven three miles in three years in that truck and finished yeah. it on the way like that yeah. that is an impressive feat it, so. uh, it, yeah it was it was barely a race car it was a <laughs> shop ornament yes uh, in fact the, the the main reason i change the tire rack on it is because i had to cut the original tire rack off of it so it would fit in my shop <laughs> with all the rest of my cars so, <laughs> so oh man what I, is... I, I literally sawzalled my truck apart to make it to where i could park it in my own shop wow uh, uh before this yeah before this race but but yeah so there there have been a few people that that have had an issue with that placing and you know not any of them or very few of them were involved in class eight at all period so what are you talking about yeah none of them were there because right. i was the only entry right you know so whatever i i take that stuff to heart i i really take everything personally good and bad and so 
I get a little uncomfortable about that because I, I didn't finish the entire race. But I want to be able to use that as an opportunity to learn and teach and yeah. grow and try again and and keep going and not quitting and and all of those things. And so, like I said, it's an honorary first place. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not getting the $10,000, which is fine. I'm not expecting any of that. I'm not going to ask for it or anything, of course. Uh, although it would help me get the truck back together, but, but, uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I didn't earn that. Right. Uh, but, but I feel like that the win can be defined in the entire experience yeah. that we had Absolutely. by, by being there and being a part of it and including others and, and trying to spread and grow and teach and learn ourselves and all of those things combined that, that equates to you to a win. Cause if, if we're honest with nobody else in the class, what are we racing for? Sure. You know, that what we're, we're racing against ourselves and yeah. the course and the clock and by that technicality, we did not win. But by all of the other opportunities, I don't get paid to do this. People don't pay me to race. I don't have to. I don't have to win for anybody but myself. Yeah. So being able to look back at the experience and see what kind of influence that had over multitudes of people. And, and generations, I mean, there were parents with their kids that were getting in the truck to take pictures and this and that. And, you know, be, being able to provide that for others is what I'll count as, as the win. And, and what I'll count as us, as us uh, be, being accepting of that first place trophy to, to represent that, you know, and, and, and I'm okay with that. And I, I think, I think that's okay. Dude, I I, think that's okay. I am beside myself. This is an incredible story, and I, I am so <laughs> grateful to be able to hear it uh, firsthand from you and and to be able to share it with our listeners as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope. This is fantastic. I hope, people, I hope people enjoy it, and I hope people gain from this that, that whether or not it's off-road racing, it doesn't even have to be car-related. If you put in the effort – there will be success yeah in in some form you may not get the success that you're looking for i wanted a, a big cardboard check that said ten thousand dollars <laughs> right in Gilmore style <laughs> that i could walk through the casinos with right but i found the successes in in the people and in the experience and in the opportunity and and in the 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 chance for me to do it again yeah you know to this this everything that has come from me bringing this truck back out and putting it back in the dirt and racing it has pushed me uh, to to race it at least once a year. I'm am going to race it once a year, and yeah. I'm I can't afford to go chase a series. I can't afford to chase points or anything like that. So I'm just going to pick the coolest races I can find, and I'm going to go do those. And and that's that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it with the mindset that I might win, I might not, you know, officially or unofficially, it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to bring people in that haven't been a part of it before. I'm going to provide opportunity and experience for others. I'm going to learn from them and from the entire situation. And we're just going to do the best we can show up and do the best that we can. That's awesome. And, and uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's awesome. I, I love it. I never forgot how much I love being in the truck, but getting back in the truck, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I, I cannot explain how it makes me feel inside to, to be in that truck. Well, if I, I can it. help it, if there's an opportunity and I can, and I can make all, you know, all the stars have to align. I want to be there for it. At least one race sometime in the for next sure. couple of years because for sure. it's we an incredible will, uh, opportunity. We'll, we'll get something on the books far enough in advance that we can all plan it. And you guys are absolutely invited to come awesome. out with me on yes. the trip. Even if I'm not racing and we just go to Baja to do sweep and recovery, you guys are invited to do that with me sometime too. Oh, that's fantastic. Amazing. Well, oh, Brian, yeah. uh, we thank you so much, as always, yes. uh, for the stories, the conversation, you the bet. camaraderie. Uh, if 
you are listening to this and you have not listened our fir- to our first two episodes with Bryant, go find episodes 47 and 48 where he dives a little more into his uh, off-road racing association and just everything he is doing for the sport. He referenced it a few times tonight, but uh, he, he goes into great detail in episodes 47 and 48. So uh, you can check him out and all that he's doing. Bryant, where's the best place to find you? Uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, Facebook, my, my personal Facebook page, Bryant Blakemore, uh, at least follow me, yeah. send me a friend request, but I'm, I'm getting pretty close to being full on all those. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to have to clean some people out, unfortunately, or do something else. Uh, and then Instagram, the Quachi, T-A-Q-U-A-C-H-E underscore motorsports, M-O-T-O-R-S-P-O-R-T-S is uh, instagram uh, and we'll facebook link both is, of those is, in the description below so cool. yeah the facebook content is a little more in depth just because it works better that way yeah but uh, but i try to keep both updated with the same content uh a day or two apart from each other if i can or same day if i can awesome but both those places and i'm real easy google me i'll show up and you can call <laughs> me my phone number's there and if anybody has any questions about how to get involved in the sport or anything of that nature. I'm always available to talk about those kinds of things and to bring new people in. Always, always, always. Love it. Well, Bryant, uh, it's been a late night for us. It's been a long journey for you this year. Uh, Enjoy the last two weeks of it, uh, and we look forward to catching up with you sometime in the near future. Thank you, gentlemen. I I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on. I I, I appreciate being a part of your program and that you find what I'm doing interesting enough to share with other people. As I said, I'm a peacock, man. (laughs) (laughs) If I get a chance to show my feathers, I will. Yeah, love it. Well, thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Whew. That was Uh, awesome. Well, I'm going to Baja. Yeah, well, uh, I I would say just like last time, I I feel two episodes out of just this one conversation alone. Uh, Very easily split this one into two and have the lead up. So, uh, Bryant, once again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your adventures. Uh, My goodness. The, the faith, the blind ambition, I don't know I don't know what to call it. Th- he drove it three miles in the preceding three years before, you know what? Let's do this thing. Let's go racing. <laughs> like, Screw it. Whoo! Put 70 gallons in it. Let's have at it. Yeah, when he was talking about uh, having someone ride with him, I, I don't know if you saw. I was oh. peeking over to you. Oh. I, I was like, this is on our to-do oh. list, so... Yeah, we will find a way to make that happen. Very much (laughs) looking forward uh, to that aspect of it. And uh, we'll we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. This is going to wrap up 2021, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much right in there. So uh, this being our final episode of the 2021 uh, calendar year, we're just... We're thankful for you riding along with us uh, (laughs) uh, just another year and uh, very much looking forward to just all reminiscing one (laughs) on on the past and and looking forward to more to come. Uh, So uh, being the end of the year, uh, this has been a journey for the two of us, this thing called GT Garage Talk and uh, it, it, it is not ending. It is continuing in, in different forms. You have been, uh, beyond patient. Your wife, your family has been <laughs> beyond patient because not only do you work a full-time job as a mechanic, uh, not only are you very heavily involved in everything that we do, all this is after hours for you. Yeah. Uh, all your involvement with GT Garage Talk is after hours. And, I've been blessed and fortunate enough that my life situation has shifted and changed a little bit. Uh, Still tons of grind on on my side, but freedom and flexibility. And so uh, at least for the 22 calendar year, you're going to take a little time, focus on the family, correct? Yeah, I'll be stepping back for a little while. Uh, Not sure what it'll look like in the future. Uh, You know, looking forward to seeing what, uh, what comes of garage talk, but uh, at least for the foreseeable future, it, uh, it won't involve me for a little while. So, yeah. uh, 
So uh, share some love for Matt. Uh, leave us some comments. Send us some uh, fan mail, and uh, we'll make sure Matt gets all of that uh, as he takes some time to kind of refocus, re gear, recoup. And uh, like I said, we're we're going to continue trudging on here at GT Garage Talk. It is going to look a little bit different. There are going to be a lot more interviews and just conversations with people from throughout the industry. Uh, might pull pull Matt back in every <laughs> once in a while from time to time just to uh, get his thoughts and opinions on stuff. We're still friends for 20 plus years. So uh, there's a lot of stories that he is yet to tell. And uh, just looking forward to exploring the future and what that may hold for uh, GT Garage Talk, for the Thorson family, for the Fornicke family. We're, we're, like I said, grateful for your support up to this point. And uh, yeah, see, seeing what the future holds for all of us. With that, we thank you for following along with us for another year, for riding along with us. Uh, we, we made it through two of the craziest years in the world's history, Yeah, uh, starting this podcast and a YouTube channel along the way. Uh, we thank you so much for following us. You can find more about us on Facebook, on Instagram, both at GT Garage Talk. And everything we do is at gtgaragetalk.com, including our YouTube channel where you can find uh, all the vehicles we drive, two wheels, four wheels, and everything in between. Looking forward to many more fun times. Until next time, Happy New Year, and bye.